to the Forbes Center for the Performing Arts. Please take a moment to locate your nearest emergency exit, and out of respect for the artists on stage, as well as the other audience members, we ask that you turn off your cell phones now and refrain from texting during the show. As mandated by federal copyright law, any form of unauthorized recording or photography is strictly prohibited. There will be no intermission. Thank you and enjoy the performance. Good afternoon, and welcome to my doctoral lecture recital, entitled, Continuing the Stepping Stone Path for Euphonium. In 2006, Dr. Patrick Stuckemeyer created an audio resource for advanced high school students and university students, entitled, Stepping Stones for Euphonium, Volume 1. The aim of Stepping Stones was to provide professional level recordings of a substantial list of repertoire suitable for younger students to use as a reference for their own performances. At the time of production, the euphonium community desperately needed a resource of this sort, as many of the solo euphonium performers were creating recordings mostly of new works, more suited for an advanced collegiate recitalist, and as such were, were geared more toward university seniors and graduate students. Stuckemeyer produced 16 recordings of works for euphonium that varied in difficulty, but generally were aimed to be more achievable solos for the high school and younger university student. The title, Stepping Stones, lends itself to this idea that these works would be a first step into solo performance um, for these younger students. My doctoral project, Continuing the Stepping Stone Path for Euphonium, aims to bring forth an additional list of works that would be suitable for this age group and that mirrors the original format of Stepping Stones. As the overall standards of playing by younger students has improved, as well as the emergence of, to prominence of some newer works that have taken, a new, a new list of repertoire should be considered. The primary goal then is to add to the repertoire and add to these collections of recordings of pieces aimed at this age group. As well, for the works on this new CD that are already common in the repertoire, the goal is to produce a professional recording that can act as a resource, especially compared to the widely available amateur or student level recordings um, that are all over YouTube. First, a quick look at the 16 works that were chosen by Dr. Stuckemeyer. Many of these works, like the Antonio Capuzzi Andante and Rondo, or Arthur Frackenpole's Sonata for Euphonium, are still prominent works that are used today in the euphonium repertoire, performed frequently by undergraduate studios all across the country every semester. Many of these pieces chosen by Stuckemeyer are arrangements, originally written for other instruments, like cello for the Rafe von Williams Six Studies in English Folk Song, or trumpet in the case of Andante and Allegra by Joseph Key Roparts. Many of the final nine works on this CD are quite short and don't challenge the soloist in the same way that the first nine tracks do, being quite basic in nature and in difficulty overall. Again, the impact that Stuckemeyer has had with this CD is profound, but I feel that there are a few areas where we can see some improvements and expansion of this concept, utilizing differing repertoire to build upon his original intentions on this CD. A new collection of works can and should be considered. Here are the works to be included on the proposed new CD continuing the stepping stone path for euphonium. With the exception of Sergei Rachmaninoff's Vocalise and Robert Schumann's Five Pieces in Folk Style, which are arrangements of the original work, the rest of these works were intended for euphonium. A concerted effort was taken as well to include some works that are underutilized in performance today while still keeping the main focus on the difficulty of the work and the ability levels of today's young euphonium soloists. Additionally, several of these works are, are frequently used in performance today, but lack a more professional, accessible reference recording. So each work on continuing the stepping stone path has been purposefully selected to mirror the similar type of work from stepping stones. Justification of the choice of work will be discussed, comparing the level of difficulty of various works according to the ITEA, or International Tube and Euphonium Association, standard repertoire list and grading criteria. Additionally, the work's prominence and relevance will be considered, as well as form, programmatic elements, and challenges that the performance 
that's, that these types of works bring to the performance. Quick discussion on the ITEA difficulty grading so we can kind of, kind, of, kind of get an idea on what each of these numbers mean. So the ITEA breaks down their grading criteria into four different subjects, the first one being range. So as the range extends upward and as well downward, you can have a, as many as a maximum of 40 points in terms of difficulty out of 100. And the other three categories would be dexterity for a maximum of 30 points, so looking at intervals and the size of intervals and how often they occur, as well as how often other difficult intervals occur in that piece. So up to 30 points there. The rhythm and tempo is up to 20 points, so things like jazz rhythms or you know, dotted eight 16th rhythms or other complex compound meter all play a factor in this, as well as the tempo itself. Um, the faster that it goes, the more points are awarded to that. The last category would be miscellaneous, so 10 points for the maximum there for use of mutes or rapid key or tempo changes or extended techniques, things of this nature. This grading scale is part of the main focus of these works, as many of the works on, on continuing the stepping stone path are on average more difficult than the works from stepping stones. However, there's more to these choices than simply providing a more difficult work, as the numbers don't really tell the entire story every time. The length of the work, the, the potential programmatic elements to navigate, and the prominence of the work in today's repertoire also play a factor. Introduction and Dance by Joseph Edward Barat is the first work on Dr. Stuckemeyer's CD that I'd like to discuss. Barat was a French composer born in 1882 and studied at the Paris Conservatoire in pursuit of a conducting role, uh, mostly for band or wind band settings. However, we see him more often today in the composition world for, the, for euphonium repertoire. This piece was written in 1923, and it's a continuous work in two parts, with an introduction and a dance, with the introduction being a slow lyrical opening to the piece that, that leads into a, a cadenza moment. And once that cadenza has been completed, a, a transition occurs in the piano, which moves into a small, a small collection of, of these dance motives. The dance is a much larger section of the work overall, with its exploration of different characters and moods. And the work concludes with a short return to the original dance that we hear right from the beginning of the dance section to sort of bookend this dance section. The work is often performed on tuba or euphonium, but as you see pictured here, it was originally written for the sax horn. Within the dance, several styles and tempos are used, making the work more substantial than just one singular dance figure. Students must navigate these vastly different styles with little to no pause or transition in between, um, adding a bit more to the overall challenge of the work. This piece is not incredibly difficult for the performer, scoring a medium difficulty of 57 from the ITEA. The piano accompaniment provides support to the soloist with open space for rubato in the introduction and clear time with upbeats and downbeats in the dance, helping to make this work achievable for a first time euphonium soloist, even if they're nervous about playing with somebody else for the first time. The musical motives can be a bit challenging as well, but as they're fairly repetitive, the student can tackle the technique without feeling overwhelmed. The world is inundated with recordings of this piece. However, as more composers and their works surface, other works deserve a place in the repertoire. Another work by Barat, one underutilized in the realm of euphonium repertoire, will be discussed next. I'd like to take some time now to play Introduction and Dance by Joseph Edward Barat.
The work under consideration to take the place of introduction and dance is another work by Barat entitled Morceau de Concours, written 11 years later in 1934. In a similar style to introduction and dance, this work begins with, a sl with slow melodic elements with cadenzas breaking up the use of piano. The cadenzas in this work, however, are more challenging, utilizing faster rhythms, repetition of phrases and variation, and as well, a much lower register when arpeggiating downward. 
This first musical example is the cadenza towards the beginning of Introduction and Dance, where, though this is an exposed moment for the soloist, the demand for the music isn't all that high. By comparison, the, there are two cadenzas in more soda concours, the first one being shown here. The phrase ideas are more connected, as well as being the same sort of idea two times in a row, forcing the student into a decision to be made for musicality, like timing and dynamic pacing between the two iterations to keep the audience compelled. This second cadenza is most like the cadenza from Introduction and Dance, following a similar contour of line and beginning in much the same way. Barat asks for more of the performer here, with the optional drop of an octave in the middle of the cadenza. The composer also implements thematic material from the previous section of the solo. As well, the last line of the cadenza mirrors many of the same intervals that began the first cadenza, further calling back to previous material. The performer then is asked to successfully connect these various ideas and the work together in this one cadenza, furthering the, co the cohesion of the overall musical product. Though both piano parts from Introduction and Dance and More So to Concord are graded at a medium difficulty, the pacing of the music and transitions are more challenging here, due to the plethora of cadenzas and pauses adding difficulty to the overall ensemble cohesion of sound. As well, there are long sections where the piano is playing triplets while the soloist is playing eighth and sixteenth notes, creating a timing challenge with the relationship between duple and triple. Range is significantly more challenging, with the pedal C in the second cadenza being the lowest note, a full octave lower than the lowest note in Introduction and Dance. As well, the highest note is A flat, a half step above the highest note of the previous work by Barat. The work ends in a cheerful, waltz-like fast three pattern, felt as one beat per measure. The challenge this section presents is in the fast tempo and in overall timing with the piano, as well as the quick descending triplet figures. The ITEA grades this work at a, at a moderate difficulty with a rating of 70, proving more difficult than the 57 given to Introduction and Dance. However, I believe that it should be even higher, as contrary to the discussion we have on range grading, um, I believe that they made an error with regards to Introduction and Dance and that the difficulty should actually be shown as being higher for more sort of concours. Though this work is by the same composer, and in the same sort of style with its slow, fast structure, the piece is by comparison underutilized. Uh, based on the current playing capabilities of young performers, I believe that this work is a more challenging, more rewarding piece of music by an already well-respected composer in the world of euphonium repertoire. I'd like to now play for you Morceau de Concours by Joseph Edward Barat. Thank you. 
Fred Kleiner Jr.'s composition entitled Sonata for Honor Company Duphonium is the next work to be discussed from the original Stepping Stones. This piece was written in 1978. A three movement work for Honor Company Duphonium, this work provides many opportunities for tempo changes and challenges in terms of range, specifically with its heavy use of the upper register. As well, the individual responsibility unaccompanied works provide in terms of timing, rubato, and dynamic contrast is a challenge to a first time soloist. They are alone in creating the sound in the piece, which can be intimidating. The first movement begins with an introduction, creating motivic fragments like this B-flat to C, sighing motion, indicated by the red boxes in the music. After the introduction, Conrad uses this motivic fragment in an accelerando into the allegro, serving as the exposition of the first movement. Instead of developing these opening themes, Conrad moves instead into a lyrical legato section at half of the allegro's original marked tempo. 
This lyrical section comes to a conclusion in the same way that the introduction does, utilizing this B-flat to C sighing motific fragment once again. The first movement then concludes with a recapitulation of the original Allegro ideas. This choice by Kleinard makes the first movement feel like a small sonata form work in itself. The second movement, entitled Song, is largely a slow melodic movement aimed to showcase musicianship and quality of sound. As well, there are plenty of opportunities to play with the time and dynamic contrast to enrich the performance. The finale is much more raucous, with, it, with the greatest challenge being these angular motives that occur over a variety of time signatures, making this last movement feel frantic and full of energy. In the middle of the movement, the soloist has a conversation with themselves, playing both this soaring melodic line and a more rhythmic bass line in close succession. Overall, these quick changes between motives create a challenge in the finale outside of the already challenging use of the upper register. The entire three movement work follows the more contemporary sonata form of fast, slow, fast. This sonata remains one of the most popular works for young players, offering a solo of medium difficulty to explore the unaccompanied solo repertoire. The ITEA grades this solo at an above average difficulty with an average score of 55 and one third across all three movements. I'd like to now take the time to play a selection of movements for you from Fred Kleiner Jr.'s Sonata for an Accompanied Euphonium. Thank you. 
The proposed piece of music to serve the same purpose of the Kleinard is a work by Howard J. Buss entitled A Day in the City, written in 1986. This work is in seven, seven short programmatic movements. The performer must consider changing styles between the collection of slow and fast movements, and as well must emulate the, the imagery that the composer hopes to convey. The movements are as follows. The first movement is Another Sunrise, which captures the waking up and restlessness of the big city preparing for yet another day. The second movement is off to a busy day, where a bus emulates traffic in the busy streets, as well as the cautious optimism and energy the city provides in, in any particular day. The third movement is Lost Key Episode, where as you may expect, the music wanders, searching for their lost keys. However, there's a bit of blissful ignorance in losing your keys, alluding to the idea that lost keys may equate to lost responsibilities, at least temporarily, where we can live a bit more carefree for a moment. The fourth movement is entitled Wait, The Waitin' in Line Blues, emulating the idea of the happiness and sadness of waiting to get your tickets to your favorite show. The fifth, movement, the fifth movement, Romantic Interlude, is where the soloists can be the most emotional, expressing through the music a story of their loved ones and yearning to get back to them. The sixth movement, Sudden Storm, figuratively rains on the parade of feeling romantic bliss, with the angular lines feeling like a heavy rain or even lightning. Finally, we arrive to the seventh movement, Out on the Town. Walking through the town and hearing buskers on the street corners, playing Latin and jazz music to earn a dollar. This work is comparable to the Kleinard in many ways, due to the stylistic changes and technical register cha challenges that Buss's work presents. In general, the piece is a bit easier than the Kleinard, rated at an average difficulty of 49 across all movements, according to the ITEA. However, as stated before, there's a separate challenge from simply performing each movement. The performer must accurately portray each style of the movements, both in tempo and in elements of imagery. Taking a look at the opening lines of the fourth movement, the Waitin' in Line Blues, there are these markings of ST, meaning straight tone, and CV, meaning corny vibrato. With these two distinct characters, performers have to quickly change the concept of sound being produced phrase by phrase. These different voices coincide with the feelings of elation and getting to see your favorite show, and then remembering that you still have to wait in what feels like an endless line to get your tickets. The performer could also view this as two separate people talking and complaining about having to wait in line. This is just one example of Buss's programmatic features of the work, where the student has to convey, convey a very specific idea. Mental and physical endurance would also play a factor in the performance of this work, since it's quite a bit longer than the Kleinerd. This would provide a great opportunity to perform unaccompanied music for the first time and build confidence while also exploring ways to convey imagery and programmatic ideas through your playing. Though the Kleinert is still highly regarded as a substantial unaccompanied work for younger players, Buss's newer work is highly accessible and provides some unique challenges. Replacing one, one unaccompanied piece with another seems fitting. I'd like to now play a selection of movements for you from A Day in the City by Howard J. Buss.
The last work to be featured is Sigvart Dogslin's Michelangelo. This is a fairly new work for Euphonium, written in 2006, so the same year that Pat Sokomar's CD Stepping Stones was released. This piece is originally a Norwegian pop song, first released in 1992 and sung by the composer. With regards to Sokomar's CD, this piece would replace Song to, song to the Evening Star from Tannhauser uh, by Richard Wagner. The idea, the ITEA, gives the Wagner a difficulty rating of 36. And by comparison, Michelangelo scored a 47, fitting it right into the difficulty area of the rest of the works on the proposed new CD and the age group it's intended for. In contrast to some of the final eight works on Stepping Stones, Michelangelo is substantial enough to be worth studying at that age group, but not so easy or so hard that it feels outside of a young performer's capabilities. The final nine works on Stepping Stones grade as low as a 19 from the ITEA. So for the sake of producing a new resource, I aim to narrow these eight works down to three more substantial works, Michelangelo being one that fills the role of the slow, melodic solo. Some of these works are graded at a more difficult level than others, with Cheerio at a 55, for example. However, this piece is less than two minutes long. There are some, some, there are some difficult passages in each of these works, absolutely. However, these works, the works themselves are insubstantial, seeing very little performance time and use outside of the Stepping Stones CD itself. By contrast, the final three works on continuing the Stepping Stone path hover at a higher level of difficulty in the 50s or the 60s. Though these works are more challenging than the final eight works from Stepping Stones, they are much more often utilized and present in today's world of repertoire. In order to produce a more concise and helpful resource, the decision was made to narrow the scope of the album from the original 16 works down to 11. <clears throat> the repetition of Michelangelo makes it more attainable for younger students as they can focus on mastery of just a few motives, though the range could be a factor for them. The work skews high, calling for a greater endurance and strength in the upper register of the instrument. As this area is an often underdeveloped part of the range for younger students, it poses challenges in finesse and musicality that warrant the greater difficulty assigned. In this excerpt from Michelangelo, the pickup notes into B is where Dagslin produce, pre presents sorry, the main melody of the work. The control and singing quality of the upper register could prove to be difficult for students. The value of a pretty melodic solo cannot be underestimated as it assesses the students' control of their instrument and their thoughtful musical process to create the product. Though the music repeats most of its content, the student must make a musical decision on how to differentiate or not those repeats to keep the piece interesting and moving. As well, this work provides an opportunity to perform a solo by a Norwegian composer, a solo that has a history in pop music and as well in the world of brass band with this version of the piece. Dr. Sakamara's CD, Stepping Stones, 
while an incredibly valuable resource, is pushing close to two decades old. The standard of playing for young students has come far in those 16 years, and as well as the choices of the repertoire and available options for performance. Continuing the Stepping Stone path aims to expand upon those resources already available to students by providing a collection of works to be considered for performance today, along with reference recordings to learn alongside and make their own decisions on the music. The goal is not to replace this resource, but to continue it by providing additional options for young soloists to choose from. I'd like to thank you all for attending my lecture recital today, both in person and virtually. I'd also like to thank Amy Robertson for accompanying me today and for all my recitals at JMU. I'd like to now conclude today's lecture recital by performing Michelangelo by Sigvard Dagsland. <laughs>